Anybody want to just go home? Let's just pack up and go home. Because some people would say, you know what, I have no tent, no sleeping bag, no blanket. Bless you. Let's just go home. Probably no baboons. But some people would say, tell your dad to fix it, or you tell your dad you want to go home. Oh, hunting. But some people, but some people would just say, okay, everything's gone. Let's just go home, right? Some people would. My wife would. Addie would. He'd say, let's go home. But you know what? What Jesus says when we have challenges like this, that we're supposed to face them head on that we're supposed to rise up and meet our challenges and trust in him because he'll take care of us. It's supposed to be a fake pillow. So do you guys know that if we have challenges, if we have troubles, that Jesus says that he'll help us? Did you know that? In times of trouble, that he'll take care of us? Yeah? Have you heard that before? That's the sounds of the wilderness, don't you know? Where is it? Where is it coming? It's coming from the bear. So, if you if you think of a time of challenge like this, and if you think of all of a sudden I have no comfort left, and all of a sudden things are very difficult, if you just remember what Jesus tells us, that if we just trust him, and if we have faith that he'll take care of us and we'll get through it, right? But sometimes we get in this thing called a comfort zone where everything's hunky-dory and everything's good. Hunky-dory. Everything's good. It's awesome. Right. Sometimes we have to challenge ourselves to be uncomfortable because if you're uncomfortable, that means that your faith is growing. So we have to do this thing. It's called step outside of your comfort zone. Think outside the box. I, but, well, guess guess who's outside of our comfort zone waiting for us? God. Yeah, the God is, not the bear. God is. But the bear might be, maybe that's Jesus. Because Jesus is holding out his hand, waiting for us to help us if we're outside of our comfort zone. So we're blaming everything that got, just got stolen on that Jesus? No, no, no. But Jesus is there waiting for us to help us. So I want to issue you guys a challenge. How many of you have friends? Everybody has friends, right? So for you guys to step out of your comfort zone, do you think that you could go Monday or Tuesday and just tell one of your, one of your friends that you love Jesus? Yeah. And maybe invite them to come to Sunday school with you? Yeah. And if you feel uncomfortable when you're doing it, all you have to do is think about what Jesus said, that he'll be there to help us, he'll be there to help you if you're feeling uncomfortable. When you ask your friend to, or tell your friend that, that you love Jesus, can you do that? That would be awesome. So Stacy's going to tell us what the Bible says about these challenges and about being out of our comfort zone. Says we're all experiencing all kinds of trouble, but we aren't crushed or we are confused, but we aren't depressed. We are harassed, but we aren't abandoned. And we are knocked down, but we are not knocked out. We always carry Jesus' death around in our bodies, for that Jesus' life can also be seen in our bodies. We who are, we who are alive are always being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus can live also be seen in our bodies that are dying. There was a familiar voice from, the, from heaven. You are my son, whom I dearly love, and in you I find happiness. At once, the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee and announced the good news saying, Now is the time. Here comes the kingdom of God. Change your hearts and live and trust in this good news. Well, the year was 1951. That was over 25 years before the uh, nuclear disaster that occurred at Three Mile Island. 
which occurred in March of 1979. Even though the uh, reactor core at Three Mile Island did not uh, go into a meltdown, there was significant amount of radiation that was leaked into the atmosphere. Those of you that uh, may recall that or not, but uh, there was more, uh, more radiation leaked than what they initially had said. But that particular accident pales when you compare it to the 1951 meltdown of the nuclear reactor at Chalk River, Canada in 1951. The reactor core actually completely melted down causing significant worry among the technicians there. And they knew that they needed a skilled technician to go in and dismantle the nuclear core, the nuclear reactor, had to dismantle that by hand. It was far uh, too complicated for any robots that they had back in 1951. It was probably too complicated for any robot that they have today to dismantle that nuclear reactor. Guess what? Nobody volunteered to go into that reactor core. So they had to pick somebody. They had to choose someone. And the guy that they chose, the person they chose, was a 26-year-old lieutenant in the United States Navy. 26 years old. He came with uh, quite a few qualifications. He was highly trained in reactor technology and nuclear physics. He was also among the nuclear technicians that uh, aided in the construction of another nuclear power plant called the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory. And that's in upstate New York. He worked with the Atomic Energy Commission at a New or Washington, D.C., and he had a high security clearance for a 26-year-old. He was flown in to the meltdown site. When he got there, he studied duplicate reactor that was built um, t for uh, this, just this kind of thing, for which he studied intensely to determine just what steps to go through to break it down. Working with a team of technicians, they rehearsed each tedious step that they had to go through to uh, dismantle this reactor. And then, accompanied by hi, <laughs> accompanied by uh, two other technicians, this particular technician went inside the nuclear reactor and saw something that prior to 1951 no one had ever seen before. And that was a meltdown of a nuclear reactor core. He saw it firsthand. Each of the stages that uh, he went through to dismantle this uh, particular reactor lasted one minute and 30 seconds. No more, no less. Little time was available to spare. He could not afford to waste any time. Could not afford to fumble with a bolt or a particular tool that he carried in with him. He couldn't afford the time to do so. And he had to go through each step in a certain order, lasting one minute and 30 seconds each. So making every second count was paramount. The fate of this young man and his two technicians depends upon the uh, person that you're talking to, depends upon the expert that you're talking to. The worst case scenario, they didn't know exactly what kind of effect it would have, but in the worst case scenario, beyond any permanent damage from the reaction to his body, sterility and, and other issues that can occur to uh, high doses of radiation, the worst case scenario, he would die within a year because he received while he was in the reactor core, he received as much radiation as anyone is supposed to or allowed to receive in a full year. And he received it in the short time that he was dismantling that reactor. So who was this uh, young lieutenant who accepted the challenge of dismantling the uh, reactor core? We'll get back to that in just a minute. But he accepted a challenge that was given to him because he was chosen. As Dan said during the children's sermon, today we're talking about challenges and the challenges that we face when we're in our wilderness time. That time when we're uh, feeling despair, that time when we're feeling depressed, that time when things aren't going right, when the world seems to be against us, 
when it appears that we sometimes make wrong decisions. We think that we have done something wrong. We have times of shame, times of guilt. That's wilderness time. We, we have had wilderness time and we know that we will have wilderness time again. We may not have Jesus as a bear behind us, but we do have Jesus with us during those times. And Jesus is saying to us, accept those challenges, accept each one as they come at you. Mark says that there will be wild beasts lurking in the bushes or looking, or looking around you. And we do have our own wild beasts. We have fear that hides in the bush that will just jump out and grab us whenever it can. We have temptations that act like a snake and slither around us, looking for that precise moment just to strike us. We also have despair that flies around in circles overhead, waiting for that precise moment to come down on us and devour us, take over our lives. Wilderness times have their own wild beasts. We will have those wild beasts. They are times of challenge. Our faith and our values and our trust in God, what we believe and all that uh, are tested, all of those things will be tested when we're in our wilderness times. When I turned 50 years old, <laughs> I know I don't look like I've turned 50, but <laughs> we'll overlook that for a moment. But when I turned 50 years old, I got a birthday card from a friend of mine that said, uh, happy birthday, as you grow older, don't worry about avoiding temptations. Temptations will avoid you. <laughs> well, the point is we never do outgrow temptations. Tem temptations are a very real part of life and especially challenging to us in our wilderness times. They can look like um, they come at us any time when we're short on spirituality and long on loneliness, despair, and fear and all the other negative feelings that can be out there, that's when those challenges and those beasts will pounce on us. In the wilderness, temptation can cause us to stray from our value system. And with challenges that we need to hold fast to those values, hold fast to what is true that we have developed during the non-wilderness times. In the wilderness, the temptation, can take, uh, the temptation is to take shortcuts during struggles, it's uh, time to go home when the tent's missing. We take shortcuts. God says, no, take the hard way. I am with you. Take the hard way. You will be much better off for that. You will learn much more taking the hard way than taking the shortcut. We hear voices in the wilderness that will lead us away from God. Voices that will tell us that you need to change your way of, of uh, with God, that that having God with you has not helped you. You're still in this point of despair. Taste temptations can look very appealing when faced with despair as we walk through our wilderness. The challenge is to listen to a living God and to a life-giving God, the God that we all know, the God that we trust in our non-wilderness times is the same God that's with us who has not abandoned us during those times of challenge in the wilderness. This challenge can also ultimately result in our ability to not understand good from bad or good from evil. Unfortunately, the bad does not come at us all dressed up in a pretty little package. The bad comes at it, does, I mean, does not come at us uh, wearing horns and a uh, pointy tail and uh, spiked ears and colored all in red. It comes at us in pretty little packages. We don't recognize the bad uh, sometimes when we're in our wilderness times. They don't come as pretty packages. We have a clip today from the movie God is Not Dead. I don't know if, how many have seen the movie God is Not Dead? All right, good, good deal. We have a clip from that movie. It's a little dark, and we apologize for that, but you can hear the voices, what they're talking about. It's a, it's an, a grown son talking to his mother who is in a uh, nursing home. And the grown son is the one that uh, has given in to the bad side of life. And of course, the mother in the nursing home is one who can barely remember who he is. So uh, let's show the clip.
I don't even know what I'm doing here. I mean, it's not like you even know who I am. You prayed and believed your whole life. Never done anything wrong. And here you are. You're the nicest person I know. I am the meanest. You have dementia. My life is perfect. Explain that to me. Sometimes the devil allows people to live a life free of trouble because he doesn't want them turning to God. Their sin is like a jail cell except it it's all nice and comfy and there doesn't seem to be any need to leave. The door is wide open. Till one day, time runs out. The cell door slams shut. And suddenly, it's too late. Who did you say you were? Suddenly the cell door shuts and it's too late. In the wilderness time, there's sometimes the temptation is there to give up when the challenge for us is to persevere, is to hang in there, is to um, rise up and to meet the challenges head on, persevere doing the right thing and being faithful to God and trusting God and listening to God and loving others as God loves us. My favorite one of my favorite Bible verses I will take the liberty of reading today comes from Romans, of all books. Romans 5, Therefore, since we have made <clears throat> righteous through his faithfulness, combined with our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him, and we boast in the hope of God's glory. But not only that, we take pride in our problems. Because we know that trouble produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And this hope does not put us to shame, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Hope. Hope can come from troubles. Hope can come from the challenges that we face in our wilderness. And when hope comes as a result of what we've been through, it will not only get us out of our wilderness quicker, but we will enjoy the hope that we have without the wilderness even more. <clears throat> it moves us through the wilderness much faster when we have hope. When we realize that God is saying and that Paul is telling us to press on, to keep the good faith, to keep the fight and persevere. Hope will get us out of those troubled times. In our scripture reading this morning that uh, um, Shelby read to us from 2 Corinthians, Paul states that we are pressed by every side by troubles but not crushed and broken. That we are confused but we don't know why things happen the way they do. But we don't give up and quit. <clears throat> we, are, we are down but we're not out. We keep the fight. We keep the faith. We keep it going. We're not knocked down. We press on. Meeting the challenges of the wilderness each time helps us to prepare for meeting the challenges the next time. We struggle with our temptations in the wilderness and out of that struggle comes character and hope. James tells us in his book that, My brothers and sisters, 
Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. I'll bet our nuclear technician knew how to go into Three Mile Island and fix that reactor core, even though it hadn't melted down, but it was close to it. I'll bet he didn't volunteer to do that either. Probably not going to volunteer to do it a second time. There is another advantage to uh, having these temptations and challenges in the wilderness is that we can work through these mentally and we can see the negative, the bad side of, of some, in, of some uh, uh, poor choices that we can make in this time of challenge. We make those poor choices. We can mentally look through that and see what, how uh, that can turn out on the bad side. The benefit of mentally working through that is that we don't actually go and through and make those bad decisions. We just see where they can take us. We know that Jesus, when he was in, the, in his wilderness, one of the things that got him through was his ability to keep God focused right in his eyesight every day on a daily basis. And if we can do that and keep God's focus in our daily eyes, we can get through uh, the wilderness times as well. Earlier I mentioned our nuclear technician would be ready to handle any nuclear uh, meltdown, but that he would not volunteer to do it. But he would be prepared. Now I have to tell you that, of course, he uh, succeeded in dismantling this nuclear reactor at Chalk River. He not only succeeded at uh, uh, dismantling that, but he also did not have any long-term effects of the radiation that he was exposed to when he was in this nuclear reactor core. In fact, he's still alive today. In fact, if he couldn't, uh, if he didn't, didn't survive the uh, nuclear accident, he would not have become our 39th president. Do we know who that is yet? Not have become our 39th president. Many people said that our nuclear technician has become a, a better ex-president than he was a better president as our 39th president. I'll give you a little hint that our 39th president is Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was the 26-year-old lieutenant that went down and fixed the uh, nuclear core. So the next time you're in your wilderness, remember not to pray for the struggle to be taken away from you. Rather, pray that, Lord, give me the strength to get through this challenge and boldly go through with a God-focused, head-on determination to its resolve. Amen.